So I'm going to start out today with a quote uh, that reads as follows. The treaty policy so well established when co the Confederation of the Provinces of British North America took place has since been continued and nearly all of civilized Canada is covered with these Indian treaties and surrenders. A map colored to define their boundaries would show the province of Ontario clouded with them like a patchwork blanket. As far north as the confines of the new provinces of Saskatchewan and Alberta, the patches lie edge to edge. So this is an excerpt from a 1906 article um, written by Duncan Campbell Scott. I include it here to illuminate the connections between treaties and the creation of Canada. A relationship which finds itself both widely celebrated and vehemently contested depending on the way in which it is interpreted and invoked and the context in which it is applied. So the quintessential Canadian creation story that you hear in the school books and even in some post-secondary textbooks goes something like this. The negotiation of the numbered treaties is said to have consensually brought Indigenous people and territories under the legal and political jurisdiction of the newly confederated Canadian nation state, authorizing westward expansion on terms that Indigenous people willingly negotiated and agreed upon. Selectively represented as non-violent means of incorporating Indigenous people into the Canadian body politic, Treaties have, since this point, contributed to the maintenance of a series of national mythologies around the ways in which Canada came to be. But also, and this is a very important also, a series of associated narratives that inform false understandings of Indigenous people's political location in Canada. And I'll come back to this point shortly. So Canada's origin story employs frontiers both geographical and ideological. These are illustrated by the contours of the patchwork blanket described by Campbell Scott. They are defined and extended through the perceived incommensurability of settler and indigenous ways of being, not least of which involves the belief that different social, legal, political orders and relationships with the land are antithetic and cannot coexist in the same space. This is not to say that distinctive ways of life and allegiances or oppositions to them have not impacted or shaped those of the other. Indeed, many scholars have observed that early relations between Indigenous people and settlers can be characterized by a deeper and more mutual respect for le legal pluralism. Yet, as legal scholars such as Lisa Ford have argued, these practices broke down in the second quarter of the 19th century as settler sovereignty increasingly became associated with the exercise of perfect territorial jurisdiction that required the repression of indigenous orders of law and governance. Relative to the creation of Canada, representations of treaties as land transactions are, to use the late Patrick Wolfe's framing, both eliminatory and productive. They're eliminatory in their finality, intended to ensure the end of Indigenous claims to the land, and to what Campbell Scott describes earlier in his writing as those rude and costly forms of diplomacy. Tasked with addressing uh, outstanding Indigenous claims to the land following the purchase of Rupert's land in the Northwest Territories from the Hudson's Bay Company, Canada's sovereignty and jurisdiction remained incomplete, even if already asserted. Treaties thus served a crucial role in what Wolfe refers to as the inchoate stage in the formation of the settler state. That is, the point in between the theory and realization of territorial acquisition. While Indigenous practices of treaty making with settlers long preceded Canadian Confederation, the realization of Canadian sovereignty depended upon the reduction of Indigenous people's political status to that of subjects through the extension of a legal order that would fully consummate and thus promise to maintain the structure of settler colonial society over time. As Heidi Stark writes, treaties provided an ideal vehicle for settler states to negotiate this transition as they involved the recognition of Indigenous political authority necessary to affect the cession of rights to land, while also serving simultaneously as a mechanism to initiate and maintain Indigenous political subordination. Stark explains how efforts to assert the continuity of Indigenous political authority or relationships to land would subsequently be framed as a criminal act a form of terrorism against the settler state and its proper citizens. And I think we can see very clear examples of that uh, across Canada at this very moment in time.
<clears throat> so indigenous people then who are seeking to protect our ability to carry out our responsibilities to the land are, then are repeatedly framed as radical activists undertaking illegal actions. This framing pits even the most modest assertion of treaty rights as being contrary to the national interest, which in turn justifies, normalize, normalizes, and softens state violence against Indigenous people. What I mean by softens is that this violence is justified by the settler rule of law, and those who, who did not consent to and thus do not configure their actions in accordance with that rule of law are to blame for the violence committed against them. Ironically, the rule of law is not upheld when it outlines limits on government actions, such as the principles laid out in the Royal Proclamation, which indicate processes for dialogue and dispute resolution that the Crown or its representatives are supposed to follow when entering Indigenous territories, particularly ones where treaties have never been negotiated. And so I'm going to go back to the quote here by Campbell Scott where we can see very clearly how from the outset of colonialism, the very existence of settler societies required indigenous rights to be self-determining in our own ancestral territories to be contained or blanketed, if you will. Note the, note the mutually exclusive nature of indigenous and crown territories illustrated by Campbell Scott. The parameters of civilized Canada are depicted as having been incrementally extended as treaties extinguished indigenous people's territory and relationships to that territory. Even if some indigenous people should survive in these spaces, they must think, behave, and act in such a way that conforms with the dominant social, legal, political, and intellectual orders. Thus, Campbell Scott assesses the success of the treaty policy by its ability to eliminate the threat posed by indigenous people and ways of life, which in turn helps produce Canada as an entity with complete territorial jurisdiction and a cohesive national identity. So I see treaties as a foundational access of settler colonialism around which state claims to sovereignty revolve. As the originary land transactions, they cannot be discarded by the state, as this would invalidate its political, legal, and moral claims, yet they must be selectively and strategically represented over time in order to sustain Crown claims to land and authority over Indigenous governments. And while this story finds its roots in a past period, as I said, it's repeatedly retold as a device to render the Indigenous state relationship legitimate over various moments in time. And here we might think of the current government's seemingly incessant calls for a return to the nation-to-nation -nation relationship as envisioned by treaty signatories. Yet the, the characterization of contemporary Indigenous Crown relations as nation-to-nation -nation is set against a backdrop of evolving settler colonial violence, which of particular relevance to this paper has involved the continuous political subordination and dispossession of treaty Indians. While a nation-to-nation -nation relationship between Indigenous and Canadian governments has never materialized, it remains a crucial part of Canadian identity. Repeated calls for renewal of this relationship are, once a suggest are at once a suggestion that such a relationship was once a defining feature of Canada, and that despite its lengthy record of repressive and eliminatory policies aimed at Indigenous people, treaties nonetheless continue to represent a symbol of the idealized ethnic and political plurality that Canada will strive to be once again. So here you might understand the contemporary role of treaties as part of a broader conciliatory project that Miranda Johnson describes as bound up with ideas of refounding the nation. She writes that such political ideals, uh, as you hear she's referring to reconciliation, uh, may have little to do with transformations of political power, but rather about grafting settler belonging onto a post-colonial state. The story of treaties then can be understood as playing a crucial role in the beginning of Canada, but also in Canada's rebirth in the current era of rights, recognition, and reconciliation. <coughs> as settler governments seek to obtain certainty surrounding jurisdictional questions and legal obligations through the creation of modern treaties and negotiated self-government agreements, this rebirth also requires containment of the new Indian threat, that is, uh, those Indian rights or Indigenous rights that have been recognized under Canadian constitutional law um, and increasingly at international law, um, such as those under, underlined uh, or sorry, outlined in the United, De um, United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. So this is the settler creation story that's told over and over again throughout much of Canada. But as with any story, of course, it's not the only version. <clears throat> 
For as many indigenous people and non-indigenous people are aware the Crown's transactional interpretation of treaties stands in direct contrast to the meaning and intent of treaties described by treaty elders and documented by indigenous academics um, and community members and activists, advocates uh, at a grassroots uh, level as well. For indigenous people, the negotiation of treaties followed a long tradition of treaty making with other living beings and with human populations. These practices predated the arrival of Europeans. They were not invented by settlers. Uh, and they helped to mediate that relationship between various indigenous populations, but also between indigenous people and other living beings in the spaces that they shared. <coughs> Treaties are intended to represent the creation of a framework for sharing the land and for governing a new relationship with other living beings, those who had recently arrived. Yet a fundamental difference in this origin story is that it was based on continuity, right? So it's the start of something new, but it's also based on a continuation. That is, the continuity of indigenous ways of being, laws, political systems, languages, ways of knowing, and relationships with the land and other living beings. At the same time, treaty partners would learn from one another, rely on one another in times of need, becoming stronger as they gained new knowledge and skills. This follows from the recognition that living beings do not exist in isolation from one another, but are interdependent uh, with other humans, with other living beings, and with the environments that we share. In order to sustain these networks of interconnection, we may learn from and contribute to the life of other living beings, but are not to interfere with their inner workings. This relationality is evident in the kinship terms, metaphors that were used in treaty negotiations to symbolize the sorts of familial relationships that would be entered into, uh, and also to symbolize notion of, notions of care, sharing, and nurturance. So as living agreements, treaties represent a form of political arrangement that is continuous and always growing. They embody a relationship, or they, um, represent a relationship where multiple forms of difference coalesce to create better conditions in the future. Again, representing both a continuity and a new beginning, but certainly not an ending. By invoking the sun, waters, rivers, grass, and even in some contexts, the rocks and mountains, indigenous peoples emphasized an understanding of human relations as everlasting and constantly growing right, across generations. Importantly, the notion of continuity also speaks to, the way, speaks to the ways in which treaties were not static or locked in time, but intended to shape the future political aspirations and transformations of partners. Rather than positioning difference as a threat, practices of treaty making follow from a deep respect for and appreciation of life across difference. While all living beings have distinct roles and responsibilities, none of our contributions are considered to be more important than the other. So the relational worldview expressed in treaties gives rise to practices geared towards creating and cultivating networks and relationships with those that we have not previously engaged with. To put it simply, if we were map to map out these relations as understood by indigenous people, our visual would look a lot more layered, uh, there would be a lot more depth, it would be a lot more blurry uh, than that patchwork blanket described by Campbell Scott. So far, I've talked about, just briefly here, about the differences in indigenous and non-indigenous understanding of treaties. This isn't exactly a contentious issue. Many scholars have explored and established um, that treaties were negotiated um, through uh, or and across significant cultural and linguistic differences, also spiritual differences, juridical differences, um, all sorts of different uh, approaches that people brought to treaty making. But why does that matter today, and why, especially as a political scientist, does this interest me? So I'm interested in this disjuncture because I believe that it represents a broader unwillingness to see political relationships with indigenous people outside of settler frames. And that this in turn gives rise to the failure to properly understand, engage with, and theorize about, or generally take seriously, indigenous people's political positions. Perhaps more importantly, the political implications of a relational understanding of treaties. So while we might be willing to acknowledge uh, that treaties were a relationship to share the land um, and to uh, agree to live together in harmony as a symbolic understanding of treaties or the cultural understanding of treaties, what I'm really interested in is thinking about what the material implications and the political implications are of moving towards a more relational understanding. <coughs> 
So I'm also interested in thinking about the ways in which this disjuncture configures popular understandings of Indigenous politics. Of course, it impacts popular understandings of Indigenous people in a host of ways, limiting the ability of many Canadians to see treaties as distinctly political relationships. But what I'm going to speak to um, specifically here today, just recognizing there's a whole host of ways in which this um, sustains really narrow understandings of the numbered treaties. What I'm going to talk to you specifically about here today is how these narratives give way to bounded and delimiting conceptions of Indigenous people as political actors actors that renders the possibilities of being an indigenous um, political actor down to the mere provision of yeses or nos to a political offering or transaction, if you will, uh, that's being made by Canadian governments. Specifically, what I'm getting at is that indigenous people are often only comprehensible as political actors in one of two ways, either as those who say yes or support proposals that are consistent with the national interest, or two, as those who say no, and thus represent a threat to it. This portrayal does an incredible disservice to all of our abilities to understand and engage with Indigenous politics as it has since the signing of treaty. So those Indigenous people who are cast as the yes people are often those who are willing to engage in processes under terms established by Canada such as the supporters of the numbered treaties or advocates, uh, le Indigenous leaders who advocated for the signing of the numbered treaties. Or if we fast forward to the contemporary context, modern treaties, self-government agreements, development proposals, uh, and so on. These yes people are often depicted as the authoritative Indians whose legitimacy is presumed. They are seen as rational and measured and thus should be trusted in making decisions for the rest of us. The rest of us Indians who just don't get it. Uh, and uh, don't understand how the proposals being offered by Canada will be in our best interest. These, this category is perceived as easier to work with than the troublemaking Indians, and thus are engaged with more often by governments and industry representatives. They are legible to Canadian governments and society. Their positions are taken seriously, and they generally have greater powers of voice and representation in mainstream politics, institutions, and media. So what's wrong with this? I mean, there's a whole host of reasons why uh, this is wrong, and many of them are very obvious. But I believe that this pos position reduces Indigenous people's political positions and contains the possibilities for a more nuanced engagement of such political actors as individuals or collectives who are making complex decisions that often entail risks, sacrifices, and trade-offs and who may also have important critiques and insights into the processes and negotiations they're undertaking. So just because you say yes to something doesn't mean that you agree with it wholeheartedly. right? Just because you enter into a negotiation doesn't mean that um, it's, it's doing all the things that you want it to do. right? You might have an accompanying critique of it. So, um, you know, many of you might be uh, thinking, or likely thinking, that I'm talking about the current situation faced by the Wet'suwet'en people and wondering what, if anything, this has to do with the numbered treaties. In a sense, I am referring to the current socio-political climate. It's hard not to these days. Um, but with the process of holding up Indigenous people who are seen as being on the same page as Canadian and provincial leaders, this process has a lengthy history going back to early treaty negotiations. And so I want to historicize this tendency that I'm noticing. Leading up to and during the negotiation of the numbered treaties, Crown representatives would often engage select Indigenous leaders to make decisions for their communities, despite being repeatedly told by these leaders that they could not speak for others. They did not have the authority to enter into these complex, broad uh, political agreements on behalf of entire communities, many who were away or absent from treaty making. Indigenous leaders who were more critical of government proposals and policies, including treaty offerings, uh, or who resisted the government's general treatment of Indigenous populations during this era, had their political authority and positions dismissed in a variety of ways, sometimes even being deposed from their positions as chiefs and uh, replaced with a chief who was easier to work with. <clears throat> 
What happens here is that indigenous people who are more willing to work with Canada are framed as consenting to its terms, and indigenous political assertions are reduced to the ability to literally write one's name or scratch an X on a treaty document. What I'm interested in is how this framing is a consequence of understanding treaties as transactions that indigenous people can only agree or not agree with. It eclipses the political implications of Indigenous visions of treaty, containing our ability to see and understand the nature of Indigenous political imagination. In the contemporary context, uh, a comparable example might be how when a, a proposal, a government proposal or proposed development obtains approval from, let's say, one to two First Nations, it's widely applauded as having Indigenous support for the whole project, even when it's also experiencing widespread resistance and critique from other indigenous people. So this result, again, uh, is a failure to properly, or sorry, the result is a failure to properly comprehend indigenous poli people's political positions relative to Canada, as the mythologies I spoke to earlier give the impression that indigenous people, at least in the prairies, sold their land and relinquished their political status, and so have no contemporary political authority, jurisdiction, or legitimate role in making decisions that impact indigenous and non-indigenous people in Canada. So we've talked about the people uh, that uh, are often represented as those who say yes, but let's turn to those who say no now. These are the indigenous people whose political agency and position is often never engaged with at all on account of their presumed complicity either in a legal action or their status as those who are not of sound enough judgment to have their political positions taken seriously. Their critiques are often written off as biased for their proximity to Indigenous life, as hypocritical if they deviate from caricatures of pre-contact Indigenous life, as a historical grievance that we should just move on from, or as the result of being influenced um, by those interested in pursuing other political agendas, such as climate change. Right? All of these framings reduce Indigenous people's um, political agency, the people who are making those critiques. Indigenous people's subordination in Canada in the name of Canada is then blamed on us as the authors of our own destiny, our failure to take up and appreciate the proposals being offered to us. And this understanding is only further bolstered by heavily racialized and classist logics which situate Indigenous people who say no as outside of and even detracting from the Canadian interest. Not only does this misrepresent Indigenous political movements, but also individual uh, Indigenous people as political actors. While liberal political theory makes space for reasonable disagreement and dialogue, negotiation, and, if appropriate, accommodation, what it does not have space for is the articulation of political positions that go beyond a request for recognition and tolerance within the Canadian state. So popular interpretations uh, and representations of Indigenous people, they can hear an outright yes or no from an Indigenous person, but have a lot of difficulty thinking past this reductive and dichotomous framing. When Indigenous people are perceived as saying yes to the conditions of settler life, these depictions fail to nuance and contextualize the accompanying critiques that Indigenous people might also have or it fails to rel relay the other elements of Indigenous po people's political positions, those that transcend a simple yes. When we say no, it is only ever interpreted as a stubborn failure to support crowd and now federal and provincial pr political interests. What often gets lost is how when Indigenous people say no, we are also saying yes to something else. Right? So it's not just a wholehearted no, that no is an embodiment of a yes as well. We are affirming the centrality of an alternative form of life that exceeds Canadian political offerings, and in a broader sense, liberalism's possibilities for engagement. Such depictions fail to account for what scholars such as Leon Simpson call generative refusal. This no is often based in a refusal to subscribe to the same sorts of interests and ideals that configure the settler good life. <coughs> but it's also based in a form of political imagination that exceeds the bounds of what Canada is offering. And importantly, we lose sight of the often multiple yeses that accompany Indigenous people's no.
So what I mean by accompanying yeses is that refusal is often ge directed towards generating fundamentally different conditions. Um, and the d conditions that are unavailable through the political containers of agreement or disagreement. It renders the no and accompanying yeses illegible to many uh, precisely because the conditions of possibility for the settler good life have in many ways hinged upon the denial of indigenous people's alternate life ways. These life ways don't seamlessly align with settler structures of governance, and so are seen as too risky to be given legitimacy in ways that might shake that very structure. Thus, indigenous people can be self-governing, but only in ways that don't require the redistribution of land, jurisdiction, tax revenue, and so on. We can have Aboriginal and treaty rights, uh, but certainly not rights that can't be infringed in one way or another when it's in the national interest. We can be political actors, but not ones whose political imagination is allowed to materialize and configure the state in ways that are outside its current imagination. So this narrow conception contributes to the perce perception that indigenous people don't have established political traditions uh, or forms uh, and methods of political uh, theorizing that we are always having our political movements configured by our response to what Canada is offering, either in terms of yes or no, right? When of course we know that's not the case. Our ability to theorize politically uh, and engage in processes of, of visioning uh, are much more complex than that and much more uh, established than that. And so I propose to you that much like Indigenous people's understandings of treaty, uh, transcend bounded conceptions of space, law, and politics described by Campbell Scott at the outset of this uh, paper, so too do our political positions exceed the bounded depictions of Indigenous political agency that exist within the register of yes or no. This is to say that the discourse on Indigenous state relations can be nuanced and advanced by engaging in a deeper way with Indigenous people's complex political positions, and by doing so through framings that accord with their relational foundations. Many Canadians find it so deeply confusing when Indigenous people have positions that don't neatly conform to this register, when all Indigenous people in a community can't just articulate their positions through a unified yes or no yet they are willing to engage with the complexities of non-Indigenous political platforms and positions. What is lost here is the way in which Indigenous critiques are not just saying yes or no to Canadian offerings, but that they often emerge from a desire to transform the nature of the relationship itself, where we can be self-determining in the truest sense, that is, we are engaging in political processes of our own choosing. Rather than painting a polarizing and simplistic caricature of the way in which Indigenous political positions either do or do not accord with settler ones, which only reinforces tensions, we require a much deeper engagement with the nature of Indigenous governance so as to fully understand the reasons, the grounding, and the visions underlying Indigenous assertions and critiques. While the significance of indigenous relationalities and specifically relationships with creation is increasingly being recognized in discourses on indigenous ways of knowing, research methods, educational ped pedagogies, and law even, I still think we're in the early stages of thinking about how critical examination of indigenous ideas of relationality can help better understand indigenous people's political positions during treaty negotiations and also our political positions today. So thinking about treaty implementation through a relational understanding rather than a transactional one can allow us to draw out a better understanding of indigenous political positions reflective that reflect our fundamental interdependence rather than strictly thinking about treaties through reactive or oppositional lenses. Instead, a relational understanding of treaties can facilitate the resurgence of our customary ways of relating with other communities in the worlds we live in. It offers significant promise for informing a renewed vision of the distinct resp responsibilities of treaty partners at personal and collective levels, and for transforming contemporary social and political relations within and between groups. It serves a radical function for Indigenous people by providing culturally specific grounds upon which to engage in processes of resurgence and mobilize politically towards visions of decolonial freedom. Most importantly, it honors our relationships of interdependence with one another and the world we live in, teaching us how to balance contradictory impulses, resolving disputes, and engaging in respectful and reciprocal, reciprocal interactions between diverse entities in the natural world.
So I think I'll end it there and just open it up to conversation uh, and questions, if you have any, <laughs> or anything you just want to comment on.